What is up everybody? For today's video we're going to be doing something a little bit different and I'm going to answer some questions that I get a lot about flipping and how I get my materials and tips and tricks. So, Hello everyone, this is going to be the beginning of this week's video. Um, since you guys saw me last, we have had another wave of pretty wintry weather come through. A lot of the country got snow this week, but we actually did not. It's beautiful and sunny out today, but it is kind of cool. The high today is about 50 degrees. So I figured I would take advantage of this opportunity before spring really gets here to do a little bit more homework. And uh, this is probably hopefully going to answer a lot of the questions you guys have about flip spots and how to make flip spots. Um, or at least the way I do it. Everybody has their own way that they do it differently. And I'm going to kind of go over my code that I follow for making spots and uh, hopefully be able to help some of you guys out who have property and want to create a flip spot. So let's get into it. So this little corner of my yard here, I have a few things set out that uh, I plan to place elsewhere on the property. And uh, in hopes of attracting more reptiles and amphibians. Obviously the first step to creating a flip spot is to have stuff to put out like this and have somewhere to put it. In some instances there are public lands that you can get access to create flip spots on but for the most part you're going to be looking at private property and talking to people that you know that would be potentially uh, open to letting you create some kind of flip spot on their property. If you're lucky enough to have your own property that you can access at any time, you're in the best situation possible for this. Um, I understand that a lot of people don't have access to that, um, but hopefully I'm going to be able to answer some questions that will be helpful in, you know, letting you guys know if your property is suitable for this or if it might be a waste of time. So I'm going to get into that here shortly. So obviously there are a lot of factors that go into whether or not your yard is potentially suitable for being able to find snakes. If you live in a really tightly packed, well-kept subdivision, uh, the chances of you having resident snakes in your yard are gonna be slimmer than someone who has a pond on their property, for example. Any sort of water feature is going to be great for snakes. If you live along a creek uh, or a river, even better. If you have access or if your family owns property or if you have a friend that would be open to letting you put out cover on his property, uh, and they have you know 80 acres or something insane like that you are in a great shape where i live i only have access to about eight acres of land i have dozens of species of reptiles and amphibians living here on this eight acre property and that is a lot of land but at the same time it's not a lot of land putting out cover for snakes um, can be surprisingly productive on surprisingly small plots of land so uh, don't be discouraged if you don't have access to eight or more acres um, you could do just fine if you have one really good acre of property so there's plenty of water features around here which i think is what makes this area relatively productive for snakes there's a creek a river and this pond here within a mile of my house so uh, plenty of water these water structures allow amphibians to breed um, which provides food for reptiles and everything else so uh, obviously it's going to be really important to have some sort of water structure nearby although it's not critical if you don't have something like this on your property um, it's not the end of the world. But it is something to look for if you're trying to kind of assess how suitable your land is going to be for creating flip spots for snakes. Now, without doxing myself, I do live in a pretty rural part of metro Atlanta. So there are a lot of people around here, but there's not a lot of really developed areas. It's pretty rural. Um, there's a lot of farmland and a lot of natural areas, thankfully. Um, but this isn't to say that even if you do live in the Atlanta city limits, you couldn't find snakes in your yard. I think that basically every yard on the planet has potential to have snakes because they can live in something as small as a flower garden, um, especially the smaller species. But how many snakes and what species you have is going to be largely dependent on what kind of property you have, how big it is, and what sorts of natural resources you have access to on that property. So my setup here at home is kind of... Uh concentrated in two main areas. We have the area here by the pond. And this area here by the pond has a really interesting little micro habitat around it where there's this really loose soil, like you can just stick your finger into the dirt here. And because of that, this is something that's really important if you're looking for larger snakes, like king snakes. There's this super loose, pliable soil that when you turn over one of my cover boards, there's a lot of rodent activity. You can see the rodents are pushing this dirt around, creating tunnels, creating nests. And uh, this is, 
If you're throwing out cover on your property and you're seeing stuff like this underneath it, that's a good indication that you have healthy rodent populations, which are gonna be really important to supporting healthy big snake populations like rat snakes, king snakes, and even venomous snakes like rattlesnakes and copperheads. Now you guys have seen me flip this stuff before, but I never really go into much detail about what it is or how it got here. Uh, these two boards right here are just kind of little plywood sampler boards. This stuff disintegrates pretty quickly. Um, it is really good for flipping, but it doesn't last too long. This piece has probably been here maybe a year and a half, and uh, I don't expect it to last more than maybe a year and a half more. And then over here, we have a gigantic piece of corrugated roofing tin. This is some of the best stuff that you can get. It's warm to the touch even on this cold February day. It's about 49 degrees today for a high. Um, but this tin is noticeably warm. If a snake were to be hibernating underneath this tin uh, in a rodent burrow or something, I wouldn't be surprised if he would come up and thermoregulate underneath here on a day like today. I've already flipped this, there's nothing under it, but there are a lot of rodent burrows and fire ants, so I don't wanna disturb the fire ants more than I have to. But anyways, one of the things I wanna do today is take some new pieces of cover out and lay them out. This stuff right here is just on the edge of my yard. My house is right there and then the pond is right behind me. But I have a couple of pieces out here um, that over the years I move around a lot. As trees grow and shade out areas, there's places that used to be good to have cover that aren't anymore unless you maintain them. And uh, this is probably a topic for another video, but this little area right here, you see this piece of tin is in a super open area. We actually cut down a bunch of trees invasive privet trees here last year to keep this nice and open. Um, this tin does get too hot though. That's something you also have to consider is that this cover can be too hot if you place it in a super open area. Um, and that's why I like this little area right here because in the morning it gets really good sun and then in the afternoon it's shaded when it's hottest. I haven't flipped this yet, but we're gonna do it right now. Fire ants. So that was disastrous. There's tons of fire ants under this piece and uh, while it is discouraging, I don't get too worked up about these guys. They certainly are invasive, super harmful. But at the same time, they do this really interesting thing where they loosen the soil beneath the cover. You can see they build these little mounds and I'm sure you guys who are used to fire ants uh, see all the time. But generally when I see fire ants under my cover, I don't think it's the end of the world. Um, a lot of people will move cover when they get fire ants under them and I think that's a mistake uh, because they don't last forever. Uh, eventually this cover will start to get too hot that these fire ants won't be able to live underneath it. They'll have to move their colony elsewhere, um, which I don't really know too much about fire ants, but I have noticed that they rarely stay under cover forever. Uh, there's certain pieces that do tend to maintain fire ants more than others, but there's a lot of places even where this isn't even gonna matter because there are no fire ants. But I figured I'd touch on the subject. So basically what I wanna do today is set up a couple of new pieces here on the property and kind of show you guys the thought process that goes behind setting up some of these spots so that you can hopefully replicate with uh, some degree of success in your own property. So one thing I haven't really touched bases on is where I get all this stuff. Um, there's a million different ways to get it. You could buy it brand new, um, but generally the best way for me is to scavenge it. Look for people that look like they're about to tear down a building. Ask your family and friends if they have any extra materials on their property that they wouldn't mind you having. Uh, piles of boards and tin that are just going to waste. And I think you guys would be surprised at how many people just have this kind of stuff laying around their house and are willing to get rid of it. So while you could always buy it, um, if you have any sort of network of family and friends that uh, own property, it'd be pretty easy to acquire decent amounts of materials just from you know talking to people you know. Another option that's really good for getting boards, it's actually where I got that board, is going to construction sites and asking if you can basically dig through their leftover materials that are going to get thrown out. And they throw out a lot of good stuff at places like that. So new home construction sites, even like especially big building urban construction sites tend to have a lot of boards. And uh, just simply waltz in there. Make sure you're obviously not trespassing or going anywhere where you're going to get hurt. But uh, try to find someone to talk to and just ask them where they keep their extra materials and if you can have any. And chances are they will probably say yes. So um, that's the gist of where I mostly get this type of stuff. So 
I guess right now I'm going to go ahead and walk this piece out to a suitable area and I'll break down why I'm putting it where I'm putting it and we'll go from there. Obviously some of this stuff is quite big so you have to get kind of creative about moving it around. Consider asking a friend that you trust to help you lay out stuff. So these boards right here, which I haven't actually flipped, are boards that I put out this fall um, because I thought this little area here needed more cover. And uh, only a couple weeks after putting them out, you see the creeks right there. We're on a nice open power line cut, nice hardwood forest here. And right on this edge is the perfect place to lay cover. So this is the type of microhabitat we're looking for. This will grow up quite a bit during the warmer months, but during the winter, it's really easy to walk through. and. Uh, the boards get a lot of sun. And this is one thing the boards are good for, the tin is not. Generally tin put in super exposed areas like this, it's gonna heat up super fast, even on cool winter days like today. So these are all factors you have to take into consideration when you're setting up a spot like this. So I think since I put these boards here, I'm gonna put this one down a little closer to the creek and we'll see how it does over the course of the year. Um, but I am gonna flip these since I haven't done that yet. It's that time of year where I would expect to start seeing snakes pretty regularly under this stuff here at the house, but it is pretty cool at the moment, so. So a lot of people will recommend raking underneath the cover when you place it, like raking out this layer of leaves and, and duff to kind of, I guess, expose the bare dirt to your cover. And I disagree with that. I don't think it's a good idea at all. I think a lot of the snakes that you're finding under cover are living in this type of like just leaf litter. And it like, these leaves are warm to the touch, and I think a lot of these fossorial snakes uh, actually spend most of their time in that thin layer of leaf litter rather than underground. Um, and on top of that, it creates space for larger snakes. You see there's a little spot right here where a big king snake or a rat snake or something could fit in right there, in addition to the space that's created by these little pockets underneath the boards. And uh, space is something that you really have to consider when putting out cover, and it's one of the things that... I think is the most important that people kind of overlook. Um, that's why I really like this piece right here for king snakes. It has this kind of, this used to be part of a, an old like reptile or chicken cage or something, but it started falling apart. So this was, I think was previously just like the back of the cage. And uh, you've got this really thin board, which by itself wouldn't be very good because it's super light. It's about like those. I mean, they're decent, but they're not incredible. But I really think this thing right here is going to have some great potential to produce king snakes. Because of this nice little lip right here, it's going to create a lot of space underneath the board. And having these 2 by 4s or whatever these are nailed onto it creates weight too. And weight's also a good thing because it prevents the thing from having too much space generally. It keeps it anchored to the ground. Um, a lot of times when boards get wet and dry up, they'll bow. Kind of like this one's doing. You see how it's got the edges kind of coming up there. You don't really want that in a... I think having this stuff kind of nailed around the edges will add weight and prevent this thing from bowing up like that. So that is how you know that even though it's cold, spring is here, you start getting ticks. This guy right here is a Lone Star tick. And I believe these guys are known to transmit quite a few diseases. So always keep an eye out for ticks, even if you're in your own yard. Anywhere that has deer and other mammals pass through is gonna have ticks. Alrighty, so I have decided to put this thing with the spacey end down on top of this nice grass right here. And I think this area is going to be as good a place as any for a king snake. Uh, I know they use this creek corridor often. It should also produce other snakes, but uh, just to give you a look at the habitat, beautiful stream here in the Georgia Piedmont. Nice fallen trees with upturned root systems. And there's probably lots of holes up underneath this bank that would make suitable places for a king snake to hibernate as well. So all around perfect little area and somewhere that I've wanted to have some cover out here for a long time. And I'm just now pulling the trigger. So mostly because it was such a hike to get down here with this big board. But uh, anyways, I think the next thing I'm gonna do is put out a little stack of 10 in a different area just so you guys can see the uh the thought process that goes into tin versus boards and uh one of the big things that you're going to notice is generally boards i like to throw them in open areas and tin i like to throw in areas that have basically a spectrum of light uh you know they start off sunny in the morning and then are shaded in the afternoon stuff like that so 
here's actually an example of what I mean. That board I put is like right over there. And then right here, we have a piece of tin that I laid out this fall. I've only flipped it once, I think, since I put it out. But I've got this one kind of half in and half out of the tree line. So when all these leaves fill in, part of this piece is going to be super sunny and part of it's going to be super shaded. So it should provide a good gradient for snakes to thermoregulate under. Anyways, I'm going to flip it real quick. There's a rodent. It's a good sign. But this piece is super warm to the touch, almost borderline too warm, just as a single. But lots of rodent activity under here. There's a big pile of poop right there. I think that's a good sign. But uh, anyways, we'll let that marinate for a few more weeks or until it gets warm again. So I'm making my way back up currently to the rest of my tin uh, to get some more and bring it out here. But I figured I'd talk about this set real quick and maybe flip it real quick. So this stuff is called OSB. Kyle Elmore of uh, Lampro, Texas has a lot of good content involving the different types of boards and the benefits and whatnot. But uh, this stuff is generally pretty crappy, but it gets the job done. I have got, I kind of put this stuff here to test and see how this area would do see if it will produce anything um and it has done really well i've gotten a king under that one and uh, a couple more kings up the hill but these little boards right here are generally pretty good for just fossorial snakes basically you can see there's still leaves under them um because i never rake them out eventually you will get to the soil once the leaves decompose but uh yeah as you can see, there's not a lot of space under this now that these leaves have decayed. I used to find a lot more snakes under this after it was freshly laid than I do now. Um, I think part of the problem with like right now is that it's so wet under these. That's probably why they aren't producing. But anyways, washing machine lid. Nothing crazy from an old washing machine we had at the house. Um, but now we're into 10. The art of pen flipping is very complicated and uh, has a lot of uh, nuanced and condition-based rules that you kind of have to follow to be able to be successful with it. And one of those rules is generally flipping this stuff when it's colder is going to be better if the sun's hitting it. And if it's warmer, you're going to want to be flipping tin in the shade or in partial shade because this stuff heats up so fast. I mean, it's metal. I mean, you can imagine how warm this is. This is borderline too hot. So one of the solutions to that is layering. Like you'll see, I have set up here. That's the first layer, like a skink right there. So this right here is basically hot to the touch, but right here is nice and warm still. Perfect temperature for a snake to be sitting right there, I would think, or underneath. Nobody underneath, but. This is relatively recently put out stuff. I've flipped it a lot of times on the channel and haven't really started getting anything under it besides ring necks yet. But I think it will be a really good little set eventually. So just like with boards, there's different types of tin and uh, the best types generally tend to be the kind that aren't very flimsy. This is pretty rigid, really good corrugated metal. And uh, generally the more corrugated it is, the better. These kind of dips that you see in the tin provide the space that the snakes are gonna be in. Because if this was just a flat piece of metal and there was no space, the snakes couldn't get between the layers or really even underneath it unless there was super spongy leaves like this at the bottom layer. This super corrugated stuff is some of my favorite, but this stuff right up here, this is worm snake slash king snake rock from last year, if you guys remember. Nobody under it yet. These are natural rocks that... I feel like we moved these here at one point, but I don't really remember. But right up here we have another stack of tin. This is less quality tin, but it still gets the job done. You can see it's a little more rusted and it only really has corrugation here, one in the middle and then on the other end. But this stuff's a little more flimsy. It's still good, but you can hear how loud it is and crumbly kind of. This stuff won't last as long and it's, it's thinner, so it heats up faster. All around, just not quite as good. But if you place it, in the right place, layer it right, you will inevitably get snakes under this type of stuff too. It just might require a little bit more effort and thinking. There's a ground skink. Generally the most prevalent species we see here in the winter time. 
now we're on to the the slightly less uh i guess aesthetically pleasing pieces of cover like mattresses and uh this is an old mattress of ours that uh as you can see it's looking kind of rough this is mostly from the rodents and stuff digging into it since i put it out here but these can make incredible cover as you can see tons of rodent activity under here um the soil is really loose and this thing is so dense that it holds a lot of humidity and doesn't heat up fast so even in the middle of the day in the middle of summer this thing is not going to be hot underneath it it'll be warm but it should be plenty good for snakes so just an idea i know a lot of people aren't probably aren't going to want to throw a mattress out in their yard but if you're kind of desperate for something to use and have an extra mattress lying around they get the job done Here's another type of board, these kind of longer skinny boards um, that are used in like porching and stuff. Generally, they don't have as much surface area, so they're not that good. But as you can see, when I flip this guy right here, there's a little bit of space there at the end and uh, it doesn't look awful. Could definitely get fossorial snakes, especially if you're in a super urban area and really the only species you're looking at being in your yard is gonna be tiny snakes. So I have this stuff set up, kind of stacked up I was just curious what I would get under it. I might end up actually putting like a piece of tin or something on top of it. But even if you don't have access to tin, you can just stack little boards like this. It gets a nice space in between it and you will get herps in here. I'm kind of surprised there's not a fence lizard or something today. Because generally this has some kind of lizard, but. Here's another type of cover that you can put out if you have access to it. It is kind of unsightly like the mattress, but this is a old carpet, really decomposed. This stuff will actually decompose on its own. It does have a little bit of plastic in it that'll take longer, but carpet is generally thought to be really good for things like kings and milk snakes, stuff that likes layers. Um, I never have too much luck with carpet. Over the years, it's been really good for fossorial snakes. I think generally when carpet gets to this level of decomposition, it kind of loses its goodness uh, when it starts falling apart when you flip it. So I'll probably replace this with a newer piece of carpet soon. The biggest problem with this type of stuff is it's just a pain to go through. It's not easy to flip, especially on camera. You can see it's falling apart because it's so rotten. But anyways, I would not be surprised to see like a little earth snake or something in this or a baby king snake, but Generally speaking, if you're looking at newer carpet than this, it's gonna be a lot better. So generally I prefer to kind of set my tin sites up in more open areas. But recently I have been putting more in the forest. There's actually a green anole basking right there. I didn't see him at first. Pretty cool. Reptiles are out. Um, wasn't really expecting to see any snakes while making this video, but if we do, that'd be awesome. Trying to sneak in on this guy. Yeah. This is a nice big adult male green and all. And another thing that's important to note, I get a lot of comments about destroying their homes when I'm flipping this stuff. None of these animals actually live underneath this metal. It's more of a tool they use to aid in their thermoregulation. Um, occasionally you will have stuff that hangs out for a couple of days. I need you to move off there so I can flip it, brother. Come on, come on. There we go. Anyways, it's pretty cool. I wasn't expecting him to be that chill. You wanna go on this tree while I flip your thing? There you go. So yeah, that, that Anole's home, quote unquote, is basically this entire hillside and he'll move around a lot. I wouldn't expect to see him consistently under this any other time of year except for now he might be brewmating nearby so I'm gonna put that down see if we can get him to crawl back onto our finger come on there you go and he jumped off ready to get back to his pile anyways nice little double stack here I haven't gotten anything crazy in this this tin actually doesn't have any corrugation which is weird but it does have a nice little amount of space right there. You can see where that anole was coming out of. So I do get snakes under it, but nothing big. So another important tactic that I use a lot when I'm trying to decide where to put tin is I put it around structure, fallen trees, um, places where I know rodents are using rodent middens, 
this little stack in particular I put out because I see a lot of chipmunks right here. And obviously those guys are great food sources for big snakes. Uh, especially if you live somewhere where you see timber rattlesnakes and you're trying to put out cover that's gonna get rattlesnakes under it, put it where you see a lot of chipmunks. So anyways, now the chipmunks and a lot of the rodents actually do make their homes out of this cover. But uh, no one's living under this, oh, there's a skink. No, no chipmunks are living under this right now. And even if they were, they wouldn't be disturbed by me flipping this. All right, guys, so we're back here on the edge of the power line. I've got a couple of pieces of tin here. This is an area I was thinking about laying stuff because we've got this nice big dead pine tree, another dead pine tree, creeks at the bottom of the hill. And right here, there is what used to be a stump hole. You can see there's kind of a rounded depression in the earth right there. So that means there's gonna be a lot of underground access. And when you see a place that has a lot of underground access like that, a good thing to do with your cover is just put it right on top of it. So generally, what I like to do, what I like to do after I stack up my tin is put some weight on top of it so that it forms to itself. Um, you can see right here we've got a three deep stack. I like to do three deep. Um, it uses a lot of tin, but it doesn't use a ridiculous amount. If you were to do five deep stacks and so on, you would get snakes in those still, but you're just using so much tin at that point. I think it's more efficient to spread smaller stacks out and figure out what areas work best. So generally when I'm experimenting and putting stuff in an area that I haven't found snakes in before, I'm going to be putting it in three stacks. So completely up to you. These were gigantic, like 20 foot sheets when I got them and I had to cut them up to fit them into my car. So a lot of the stuff I have is going to be these little five and a half foot sheets which is a really good size all around because just about any snake could fit under one of these and uh, they're not so big that they're cumbersome. So another question that this is a good time to address is when do you start flipping stuff after you put it out? Um, and the answer to that kind of depends. If I'm putting out something like this, it's a stack. I think snakes tend to come to 10 faster than they come to boards because just tin on top of the leaves is such a perfect little micro habitat for snakes to be in. So I get snakes under freshly laid tin pretty often. Um, since this is a stack and I'm trying to weigh it down over the stump hole a little, I probably won't start flipping it as soon. Um, I'll probably let it sit for a couple months. So maybe around April, I'll start flipping this um, and we'll see. But yeah, so the stick across the top is just kind of weighted it down a little bit. This tin, you see it has, it has space in between it, but it might be a little bit too much space for some of the smaller fossil reels. So anyways, that's kind of the thought process that goes behind a tin stack. Uh, a lot of the, the variables are highly dependent on what you're expecting to see in that area. Another valid strategy is that same pine tree. And I've got a nice little single here laid out alongside it. Never found anything under it yet, but I expect to eventually, especially little fossil reel stuff. So this is one of the best looking tin sites I've set up here. It's like the ultimate structure. There's this giant hole in the ground that has just been made bigger and bigger over the years. It's filled with vegetation now, so you can't really tell, but there's blackberry bushes growing out of it, which are perfect because they have so much fruit and they attract so many rodents. So I put a little stack right here. So here's kind of the last type of cover I think I'm gonna talk about. Rubber mats are actually a type of cover that I think is severely underrated. People don't use them enough, but uh, they are kind of obscure and hard to find. This one, nothing under it today, and it generally doesn't produce in the winter, but has been really good for scarlet snakes. So if you live in an area where you have these super fossorial snakes that don't come above ground really at all, you need something that is suctioned to the ground and does contact the dirt. As you can see underneath this, there's tons of burrows caused by ants and uh, six line race runners and stuff. And this is what the scarlet snakes use. They move around in this super loose soil under here in these burrows. In fact, I'd probably say there's one brumating underground there somewhere. But these work really well for aquatic snakes, mud snakes, rainbow snakes, um, and even like king snakes and stuff too. Anything that burrows 
you slop one of these bad boys down on top of some nice loose soil with a lot of burrows in it and you're gonna get snakes. This is another thing that I actually wanted to mention. If you don't have, if you have any extra like concrete or slate lying around, you can use that to create artificial rocks basically. Just throw them out in the woods or wherever and you can flip them just like naturally occurring rocks. I haven't gotten anything under this one yet, but I was really hoping I would get scarlet snakes under it and maybe I will eventually, but basically anything that's flat and can be turned over can be used as cover. All right, guys, well, hopefully this was helpful for some of you. I really wanted to get this out before springtime so that uh, those of you who are genuinely curious about setting up your own spots by your house or wherever um, you have permission to can get that done before it starts warming up and snakes start coming out in mass. Later this week is going to be basically the first week of really good springtime herping weather. Um, it's going to be in the mid to high 60s all week. No freezes, no cold weather in the forecast after tonight, basically for the next 10 days at least. So I'm gonna be herping super hard. I'm gonna try to get this video out. I might end up, depending on how the editing comes out, I might put it with tomorrow's herping vlog so that there will actually be some snakes in this. 